Mr. Keller, how we doing? Good, how are you, Caleb? I'm doing great, man. You want to talk about chickens? Yeah, let's talk about chickens. Let's do it. I don't know about you, but one of my favorite kind of chickens, although I do like eating the domesticated ones, is the wild ones, especially the ones that live in North America, especially the really rare ones like the prairie chickens. Yeah. Yeah. So for those of us who have never seen a prairie chicken, um, what are we talking about here? What do they look like? Yeah. Um, chick uh, Native prairie chickens in North America are quite unique looking. So let's go ahead and take a look at, we got two species. We got the greater prairie chicken and we got the lesser prairie chicken and they're super closely related. So this is the greater prairie chicken. They actually look a lot like the grass. They've got these, these heavy bars. I don't know if the cursor is visible there, but yeah. heavy barring that really makes them blend in where it almost looks, it's like an American bittern where it looks like they have grass, you know, going across their body. And then during the times where they're displaying, they have these crazy antennae called, called, pinny p-i-n-n-a-e that they'll hold up like this and they'll kind of pound their feet and then inflate their um their air sacs with this incredible color on it and then they get into these wild fights and in in these lecking areas where they're kind of attacking one another and fighting for the for the uh, ability to copulate with the females that come in yeah so these birds are extremely rare uh, and they didn't, they weren't always extremely rare. It's kind of a sad story. What's, what's going on there? Yeah. So this map really kind of summarizes it pretty well. Um, in the pre-settlement era, both species of prairie chicken were much more common. There were literally millions of these, especially greater prairie chicken um, that were found all the way from the, the Northern Great Plain area east into the Great Lakes. And we, we even had heath hens, which was a sort of subspecies on the coast of New England. But that went extinct in 1939 on Martha's Vineyard. So that when, when this extinction thing started happening, you, this was one of the first species as people came into an area and started to, to develop and farm it, where it started to go away quickly. Now, why does it go away? This is really important. The reason many species of birds go away is because they have very specialized requirements in habitat that are not compatible with human development. And yeah. the prairie chickens are no exception to this. Both of these species require huge areas of open lands and it has to have, you know, there's like a formula for it. I think it's, I think it's like 60% of the overall landscape has to be grassy instead of being in agricultural fields like corn and soy. And then not only do they have to have, you know, something like 50 to 100 square miles of that in any given patch, they, they also have to have the ability to leave that patch and go find a corridor to another patch that might be 100 miles away. And so pre-settlement, you know, that's what North America was. It was, you know, there was, there was forest, but then there was all these open areas too. And it was in these big connected open areas, the vast expanses is where prairie chickens were really common. Yeah, so if we can paint this story uh, even a little bit more, we're looking at the, the red area here is the unoccupied area. So that's the, the areas that it was sort of pre-settlement. And then we're looking at this pink area where it's unoccupied. So what does that mean? What it means is that um, there was an event that happened in the kind of turn of the last century, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, where we deforested much of the Midwest so that we could have cattle pasture. So if I can pull up this picture right here, let me add this to the stream. Yeah. So this is kind of what we're talking about, what we had pre-settlement. We had oak savannas throughout this region and then deciduous forest with some pine barrens mixed in. And then if we move to post deforestation. Let me, Will, let me throw one little other piece in. This is a little, yeah. little known piece. There is evidence that prairie chickens were not just in savannas and grasslands like that. They were uh, apparently they across the northern boreal forest region. They may have been present in sedge wetlands as well. This is a bit controversial. There's not total scientific agreement on this. And they certainly weren't in that when the birders got there. But it appears that they may well have been in that through Minnesota up into Alberta and even Montana and northern Michigan in the pre-settlement era. 
So not to go too far off on this tangent, but the uh, the the sharp-tailed grouse, which is a closely related uh, species to the prairie chickens, persists throughout the uh, Upper Peninsula of, of Michigan, which has um, lots of open grasslands for hay fields, but it also has a lot of these sedgy wet areas. So I wouldn't be surprised if these species were, uh, the, the prairie chickens were doing similar things. I think it's totally plausible. Absolutely. I think they're probably right. And there's, there's genetic data that, that those wetlands did in fact host them um, and served as a sort of refugium that when the habitat was being destroyed elsewhere, they could, they could still persist. And that's, that's certainly what sharp-tailed grouse are doing uh, today in, in, in Michigan anyway. Yeah. So if we go into what occurred uh, in the early 1900s in the deforestation and then the opening of all these vast cattle pastures, we actually see these big open areas that are super barren, but super good for prairie chickens. So we had this, these prairie chickens actually spread throughout Michigan where they previously probably weren't existing, at least not nearly in the numbers that they ended up exist, existing in. And we think they peaked right around the 1940s and then when the, uh, the cattle industry moved away from the Midwest and into the Southwest and into Central and South America, we actually had a regrowth, a regeneration of the deciduous forests in the region, in addition to having a huge influx of row cropping for soy and uh, corn. So these areas became eventually totally inhospitable to prairie chickens. And that's why we saw them blink out in Michigan and in many places in the late 1900s. Yeah, I mean, I the there, there's something so quaint about the the old days where we had pasture. Like, it, do you know what I'm saying? Like, when you when you go out to somebody's farm and there and there's actual grassy pasture and it's quiet, there's insects and birds chirping, the horses and things are eating the actual grass rather than having to like bring in hay and like external like corn and these kind of weird foods. Um, and that pasture land was really dominant in the '40s, and it was really important for native wildlife, not just for, you know, the farm animals. And so as, as we started to disc that up, as you alluded to, um, it came at a cost because the chickens and things like barn owls, uh, they start disappearing. There's a number of reasons for that in, in each case. But, you know, the result is, is that by 1981, Michigan literally lost its last greater prairie chickens. Um, I'll show the map here briefly. This is particularly somber for us Michiganers because, you know, I was alive in 1981. You weren't, but I was four years old. And these are greater prairie chicken records. This area in Osceola County right here around the town of Marion, what's now known as the Osceola Misaki grasslands. It's actually state-owned land. Um, but these were private pasture lands that uh, was the last stronghold of this bird. And the very last records were in 1981 and 1982 two potentially that last one is a little controversial and you know we have friends that that went and saw these birds i know many people that went there at that time and in that last winter uh snowy owls that were wintering here ate the last few adult birds and then the lek was empty after that and michigan's never had them since you know so as we go back to the the range map that's that's where michigan changes from red into pink and now we're getting down to just these green areas. And this is a very, it's a very gut-wrenching story. And it's, it's almost hard to talk about, honestly, because this, this, these species are, you know, they're part of the landscape. They're part of the spirit of North America. And we're witnessing them blink out. And it's, and it's, it's very challenging to stop them from, from doing so. So I had yeah. the incredible opportunity to finally go down to Kansas. I really wanted to see the lesser prey chicken. It's always been on my list of things to see. Um, so in, in, as you look at the map here, it's kind of like, I think about mid Kansas and South, and there's actually a couple other spots you could add in New Mexico and Texas, o Oklahoma here that, that should be green, um, but this is pretty close. And so we went to this, this private ranch. Uh, we had to set up a private tour. Um, almost all of them are on private lands these days. And let me tell you, and then we'll switch over to the lesser prairie chicken photos here. Um, it's very similar to the greater prairie chicken, except it's paler. Instead of having dark brown bars, they're kind of sandier. Um, and then the color of the, uh, the sack goes from yellow to purple. 
So they're very similar looking and whatnot, but they actually are a pretty different bird. So I want to set the stage here. Uh, this was April 22nd of this year, and we have to show up in the dark. And so this is the location that we went to. This is, this is a private ranch. We had to pay for the tour. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the landowner there, the rancher, has, he's, he's a person who really cares deeply about wildlife conservation, and he cares deeply about chickens. And if he didn't, which I think it's, there's, there's variable reactions. You know, some people don't like having these rare and endangered things on their land because it, it, it makes it a little harder for them to do the things they want to do out there. But we really ha uh, rely on these, on these landowners who do care and who, who, are, who are willing to steward the birds and that's exactly the reason we were able to do the tour in the first place. So it was absolutely magical. So it's April 22nd. Um, it was cold out, man. I mean, it was still like around, I would say around freezing. And it's this beautiful low grass prairie or like short grass prairie ecosystem, very arid. And as all prairie chickens prefer, it's a wide open expanse of, of habitat. And so... We, get, we literally get into this blind here. Um, this, is, this is the structure um, right here. And you're, it's pitch black out. And all of a sudden, the sun starts to come up over the horizon. Your hands are already getting numb, right? Your feet. And all of a sudden, you start hearing these noises. And it's bizarre. It sounds like little like a space aliens or spacecraft or something. These, woo, 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 these, like, these, I don't even know how to describe it, to be honest with you. Yeah. And then as the sun comes up, what you can see is happening is all these birds are coming in and apparently some of them are coming in from as far as maybe five to 15 miles away. Like they're making a really long dedicated flight to get right to the lek. And so as the sun comes up, here's my video that I took and have a look at this dude is, I mean, this is like once in a lifetime stuff because there are literally 15 to 17,000 individuals in the world remaining for this species. So this is two males that are kind of squaring off. Um, there's a female, the, they lack the, uh, the color in the head and then they, I think they have shorter penny. Uh, there's a female in the background there. And so basically the female comes in at her leisure and there's going to be anywhere from a few males to maybe up to like 20 males in this small little area. And they are dancing and fighting and kicking each other with the spurs on their feet and making, making these, these really strange noises. And they are brutal. Like, like they were actually physically attacking each other and ripping feathers out and stuff. Um, and it's a noise that you've never heard. But like all, all the old time ranchers and people who, who grew up like Little House on the Prairie, you know, this, this was literally the sound of the North American Prairie. And like everybody who lived there knew it. And it's so sad now because there's so few places you can go where that noise is still there. Yeah, it, it's, it looks totally mesmerizing. Um, one, because the birds are just so striking with the, the pinny and the, the yellow cap and the, the pink sack. It, that's a phenomenal bird. I, I literally like can't even put into words what it was like because it, it was so different from any other experience that I've had as a birder. Um, it, it, it was just something you have to go and experience in person to, to truly appreciate what it was like. Our blind was pretty much wide open. It had like a two or three foot opening. We were talking, we we're clicking cameras, you know, uh, we were making a, more noise than I wish we were, honestly. And they didn't seem to care. They were there for a few hours. And at one point, one of the uh, females actually flew right head on to me. I couldn't get my camera up in time. And she landed on the top of the blind right above us, which was pretty amazing. Wow. And then after a few hours, they just kind of quieted down. They would just kind of get on their belly and just sit in the grass. And then a lot of them kind of flew off at the end of it, like maybe, gosh, something like 8 a.m., 8.30 a.m. But I mean, yeah. have you seen a, a prairie chicken lek, Will, or a sharp-tailed grouse lek? No, I, I haven't spent a lot of time in that region of the United States. Um, it's definitely going to be one of the things that I'm hoping to get to because 
like like we said, these species are imperiled. The the prairie chickens and the sage grouses. If you talk about the people that are researching these birds and are uh, working to restore habitat for these birds, they're optimistic, but it's very qualified optimism because yeah. um, it's it's a really dire situation that we're in ecologically. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, what what do you think? are the biggest hurdles for these birds in terms of making a a population rebound? Like what needs to happen and do you think it's possible? I think it's a very difficult problem. And I, without trying to be overly pessimistic, I think there is a substantial risk that over a hundred year period, 200 year period, these birds could easily go extinct. It's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take a lot of coordination. Um, For example, when, when there's only 15,000 lesser prey chickens in the world and almost all of them are on private land, you, and remember, it's not just the habitat on those private lands, it's the habitat within a hundred square mile matrix surrounding them all. And and all of that has to stay in open land condition. Um, Another pressure is the drought situation with climate change. And and they were talking about this when we were there. when there's when there's drought which they are currently in it causes the seed abundance to go down so that the chicks the hens are laying fewer eggs and fewer of the young that hatch actually make it so they'll they will have entire years where there's almost no chicks that survive for that summer and then if if they get more rain the next year now the clutch size comes back up and more of them survive um so you know solving climate change this is yet another example where the, for, the faster we can get in control of it, the better the outcome is likely to be for this bird. But even if you control that, if, if the habitat continues to, to get chopped up and fragmented and disked and they get rid of the grass and in favor of row crop, it's, you know, on and on and on. Um, it gets, it, it's a serious, serious issue. And I, I mean, I, my plea for the public is to just have a awareness about this and to prioritize conservation in general in their own mind and in the way that they vote and in the and in the the organizations that they support financially um but the unfortunate truth is there are no simple answers and i i really hope that we're able to do everything we need to do so that your grandkids our great grandkids great great grandkids and on down the line won't be you know asking us to tell them stories about the good old days when we saw these birds the same way you and I have to ask our buddies about what it was like to see a greater prairie chicken in Michigan back in 1979. You know, that's, yeah. a, that's a sad state of affairs. And, and, and I'll leave the listeners with one last message. It is a tough situation. It's a little bit somber. It's a little bit bleak. And that's extinction in general. But I'll say this. These, we, if we are like these animals, they are tough. They are resilient as can be. We can do it. We can save these creatures, these creatures and, and, and other critters from extinction, but we got to do it carefully and smartly. And we've got to be dedicated and disciplined at, at doing what we do, just like these birds are. And we will get it there. Thanks for listening, everybody. Like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one. Peace.